Well, Paul, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. I know we've been trying to have this conversation for a while and have had some technical issues making it happen. So here we are talking with you while you're in Cambridge in England. And um, what I wanted to do is talk to you a little bit about a, uh, an article that you wrote a few months back uh, that was called Victory, Victory at Hand for the Common Movement, question mark. And I think that it was, uh, at least in my view, an intentionally provocative piece that you wrote. So what I wanted to do was see if um, you could give sort of a summary of uh, your argument in that, and then we can talk about whether or not your thinking has changed or, where, or how it's evolved in the months since you wrote that. Sure. Yeah, I think, as you say, it was a deliberately provocative piece to, to kind of counter this sense of doom and, and uh, inevitable failure that I think permeates the climate movement that there is this um, understandable um, sort of psychology around that, that you know we're weak, they are powerful, they have the money, they have the lobbying power, they have political influence and therefore um, the idea that the climate movement is destined for failure kind of is, is a really, it's a very significant and I think dangerous bit of psychology in the movement. Um, but it's also I think incorrect in the sense of if you look at what's happening in the marketplace of ideas in this area. Um, you know, yes, it's easy to be despondent about the lack of policy action on this space if you look at the global agreements, for example, or lack thereof. The reality is that we do have a situation where the basic idea of climate change, that it's an important issue that the science has accepted that we need to act much more urgently than we are, um, is really accepted by, you know, certainly almost all political leaders in theory, if not in action yet, in terms of the idea behind it, there's no core argument. It's accepted by most major business bodies, most major corporations, most major investors as being, you know, just the truth of our situation at the moment. So the reason I say that is not because therefore isn't everything wonderful, but clearly it's not, and clearly we're not acting fast enough. But let's remember that this political movement has already had a great, you know, deal of success and that you know, most political movements have to fight to get the elites on board with the idea. And we've kind of won that point, and now we're at the, at the stage of actually having to drive that into action. Now, I'm not being naive about the size of that challenge, but it is true that you know, when you have an idea which has the support of the heads of state of China, India, European Union, you know, every country, the US and so on, um, and the heads of most major corporations in the world as a basic idea, then you really, you know, you put that on top of this incredible bottom-up social movement that we have on climate change of activism and, you know, think tanks and scientists and so on. This is really the vast majority of people involved in the debate now. And, and we have to have that sort of attitude that we're kind of, we are actually quite strong, we are quite powerful, and we have won the core kind of argument about ideas. So that's kind of a, the, the baseline, if you like. And then on top of that, though, I think we're also at a stage um, when we're seeing very significant change in the market. So we are seeing, you know, very great mainstreaming of the idea of the carbon bubble, you know, that investments in fossil fuels are now becoming increasingly risky. We're seeing uh, analyst reports from UBS, from Goldman Sachs, from, you know, a whole range of organisations now saying, Look, we do have a very serious issue here about the riskiness of investments in fossil fuels. Also reports about the incredible boom happening in solar globally, about the disruptive nature of that in terms of the utility sector. Um, and we're having, you know, in certain, like Australia, which has been a real um, uh, uh, backward country on climate change policy for a long time, has gone from virtually none, I think it was 8,000 homes with solar panels on the roof you know, four years ago, to having a million homes with solar panels on the roof now. So the, the point of that is that we really, there is lots of evidence of strength in the movement, lots of evidence of strength in the change in the market. And, and I think, I guess, the core, to sum up, the core is not that we're in a great position, isn't everything wonderful in terms of the climate debate, but let's not get ourselves into this psychology of, of being losers, of being you know, overwhelmed by an all-powerful enemy. Um, because the reality is that I think we've got the enemy, in this case, the intellectual enemy on the run. And, and I think we are on the verge of very substantial change. Now, you know, there is an argument that we, the change we need now is getting greater and greater because the science gets more and more firm in terms of what, we, what is needed to happen. But that baseline of actually the, the possibility of very significant transformational change now, I think, is a, a very different place to be in. 
so it seems to me that there's sort of kind of three three threads here, sort of in that in that argument. I mean, the first is um, what you talked about, and that was that in terms of winning the war on ideas, in a sense, we won that war. You know, and and that is something I would say that it, that because we focus so much on the fact that there's there's little to no action on the policy front, or lament the fact that, for example, when we had the, the presidential election here in the United States, there was there were no questions asked in any of the debates about climate. You know, the only question I think that was ever asked was from MTV about climate. You know, from the journalists during the during the, the whole campaign. So I think we tend to focus on the fact that it's not being discussed enough. You know? mm. But you're right that certainly. This is something it seems like within the business community is recognized, certainly on the part of, you know, at least the G20, if not more than that. There's a recognition mm -hmm. that this is a problem. And, and that is a victory on some, on some level. I guess the question for me is, you know, will it, where does it go from here in terms of that recognition? Is it a matter of the market driving innovation to make it basically feel viable for politicians to say we can actually move on this? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to require the movement of people demanding policy action? Or have those things come together? Yeah, look, I think, you know, never ever underestimate the importance of the social movement, the bottom-up, you know, activist campaigning and community organising. I think that is, even though it has never given credit for the amount of influence it has, it creates the foundation of which everything else happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is, it is, um, more important than ever that we have a grassroots bottom-up campaign demanding action of government, demanding action of individual politicians, demanding action of business and so on. So I think that's, that's sort of the foundation to me of everything else. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also uh, the, the other reason I wrote the piece and deliberately called it, you know, victory at hand for the climate movement, um, is because there is also a political strategy here uh, about the inevitability of change. Uh, the one, of the, one of the ways we, we kind of put the idea into the marketplace um, of the, the risk of investment in fossil fuels, about the incredible opportunities in solar and renewables and so on, is by talking about the fact that it is now here and happening and moving forward. And that's, that's not a fantasy or a wish anymore. You know, there is just incredible growth happening in solar. Um, you know, any, any product that you sell that has a price, you know, a cost reduction of 80% in four years, I think it is. You know, for solar panels um, and, and continuing forecast further reductions. I mean, that's an amazing change in the market context for solar. And the fact that we're now investing globally as much in clean tech, and clean energy generation as we are in fossil fuel energy generation every year, you know, 250 billion or thereabouts, you know, it, it's before we act on climate change. Uh, again, sort of give this incredible idea of momentum in the marketplace. And so I think. I think there is a the activist movement is very very important, but I think the market is kind of poised for that shift now. And again, the reason I focus on the psychology of the movement and the science and the policy people in this area, and it's not just about activism; it's also about policy people feeling as though that the momentum is now underway, that you're in danger of being left behind. Now, you know, the U.S. is a very, as always, a peculiar case. Um, that you actually have a major party who is actually denying climate science still, and many members of it, most members of it probably are. But that's very rare in the world now. In Australia, where we have, you know, the likely next Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, is a known climate sceptic, um, but he can't say that in public. Uh, he has to actually say, I believe in the climate science, I believe there's a need to act in this area, um, even though we know he doesn't believe it, because it's not politically tenable to have that position. And that, that's really, I think, more representative of where the rest of the world's at. Uh, and the point of that being that I think that, that you know, the, the US is actually, the, the economic argument in the US of losing momentum in this area, in this investment space and so on, is actually quite powerful. And they, therefore, I think the market in the US is particularly important as a place to focus because there is incredible growth happening in solar. There's amazing amounts of money happening, you know, that are being diverted into this space. Um, and I think, therefore, we'll see a, a sudden, a relatively sudden shift in the U.S. political context once the business community really gets on board with this sort of idea. You know, talking about solar for a, for a second, uh, you know, talked about the dramatic, you know, price, uh, you know, decrease in, in the solar market. Well, what impact has that actually had on on businesses, solar businesses? Because 
to my understanding, a lot of them are, are sort of burning right now. It, was, it, it is actually a very interesting kind of contradiction, um, and, and people kind of use it as evidence that, that the solar is a bad business to be in. It's a great business to be in, um, but not if you're a high-cost manufacturer. So the, the point is that rapid price reduction driven by Chinese production have put out of business a lot of high-cost manufacturers in Western countries. And that's, of course, what happened in cars and in telephone manufacturing and everything else. So, of course, it's happening in solar as well. Um, that doesn't mean the industry is not a good place to be. You know, there is there is plenty of people who are growing rapidly and profitably in solar, and there's plenty of people who are going broke in solar. Um, and the point of that is that that's what normally happens when you have a high growth business. And the focus on those who go broke, of course, and, and, and is what you know. But it's like you know when the dot com bubble burst and, and everyone you know went broke in, in in that industry. You know, people didn't say oh, that's the end of it. You know, this industry is bad. You know, hello, by the way, we have eBay, we have Amazon, we have Google, we have Microsoft, we have a whole bunch of very significant, successful companies in that space that came out of that process. Mm -hmm. So that's a natural kind of part of the market process. And, and this boom in solar, I think, is incredibly important for a number of reasons. One, it shows scale and, and materiality in terms of the market, which I think is really very significant for investors, that there's now big things they can invest in. Um, it also, though, shows that, that there is a, a disruptive force in that market. So we're seeing in Germany, in Australia, in a number of countries now, very disruptive forces taking hold in terms of the market um, because it's undermining the business model of old companies. And that is getting a lot of attention. Um, UBS and other people have put out reports you know, anal analyzing the exposure of the fossil fuel-based energy generators and referring to the death spiral of centralized utilities. So it's not, you know, we don't know where those, those issues will end up because those issues are always complicated. There are lots of technology, business model, innovation, investment, regulatory kind of impacts that make it hard to predict where it's going. But the fact that you have a climate change driven, you know, climate change policy driven transformation of an industry, right, is we haven't had that before. You know, we've had lots of case studies about individual ideas or little businesses or startups that are interesting. We've had case studies of technologies that have great potential. Now we have multi-billion dollar plays, right, in an industry where, and we have, you know, very large industries like the utility industry that are now threatened by the arrival of solar and by solar policy. And, and there's a real kind of death spiral conversation happening in that space. And that's radical, that's revolutionary transformation if you get it right, because it is, you know, it is about moving to a distributed, de decentralized model of power generation. Now, technology and markets will determine where that goes. It may not go in that direction, but it can see a really significant change. Yeah. And that's exciting. Not, it's exciting in its own right, but it's mostly exciting because it shows to the market, hello, it's game on, in terms of the transformation to a low carbon economy. Yeah. It seems though, and I'm not trying to be pessimist here, but it's like we're having this interesting interplay here, right? between, uh, you could say, a uh, renewable industry that's starting to get some real traction and, and power behind it, and a fossil fuel-based industry mm -hmm. that's now uh, talking about a new golden age, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like, for example, in the United States, I mean, we're having, you know, our energy conversation is dominated by this idea of having the all of the above strategy. So yeah. And I actually think um, we've been going through this boom in shale gas production. Mm. And, and it's had an interesting effect. On the one hand, it's displaced a lot of coal production, which I think people that are concerned about climate see as a, as a great victory. The question will be, you know, how long term that will be, because that's been really mm. driven by um, a very steep decline in natural gas prices to the point where I think a lot of producers are actually losing money. So it's not uh, and but there's this idea that this is this resource that we have that is cleaner, uh, which is highly questionable. Cleaner, but also you know it's abundant and it's you know it's a domestic resource. So that's kind of dominating a lot of our energy conversation. Mm -hmm. And 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 I actually think it's had a bit of an impact on investments for clean technology because there's this perception of from electricity production. Mm -hmm. I think and that I actually think is. Um, you know, it's part of the game that's happening here, which is the fossil fuel industry, you know, going to these extremes to maintain 
their business model, which is providing mm -hmm. hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. And part of their strategy is to tell us that we have this great abundance and we don't need to worry mm -hmm. about energy. They'll take care of the problem for us. Um, and then it gets, and I think this is where, um, this is where I think policy really does make a difference because, uh, you know, we're in a situation where, you know, a lot of renewables are dependent upon credits that are provided by the government. The government mm -hmm. you know, takes those away. I think we're seeing those now in Europe, right? Um, mm -hmm. What will happen to the, to the renewable energy market? You know, um, so do you feel like, you know, we have, we have these successes to build on? One is the success that the, the, the debate of ideas has essentially been won. There may be people out there who are, you know, still trying to play the denial game, right? Mm -hmm. But it, but increasingly they're marginalized and not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, that the debate of ideas has been won. Lots of questions mm -hmm. about how this will all play out, obviously. Um, and then we have this emerging uh, situation that's happening where you know technology, renewable technology, is actually disrupting things on some level. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So those are those are victories and positive things. So getting to the getting to the psychology, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that in terms of how important it is to have the psychology within the movement that doesn't believe that we're going to lose, but actually believes that we're going to win. Yeah, I think I think because this is a this is kind of finally a market issue that the 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 people who run campaigns against coal plants, for example, or coal train lines or ports and facilities, um, often forget just how powerful an influence that is on investors. Right, so you know there was an example recently where I know that the anti um, coal seam gas campaigners in Australia, the the leaders of that group were invited in to talk to a whole range of investors, and you know they went in very clearly and said, look, you know we're gonna we're gonna campaign against this idea of coal seam gas everywhere it goes, right? So you should be aware if you're investing in this that we're coming after the companies you're investing in, right? And we're gonna slow them down and we're gonna attack every plant and every facility and use legal action and so on. And it was, you know, it was a very, and it's just not like a secret idea, it's clearly what the campaigners are doing. But to translate that campaign into financial terms for those investors is a very clever strategy. Terrifying for the investors, right? But it's a very clever strategy for the campaigners. And that, that kind of idea, I think, that, you know, you're putting forward this inevitability of change. That there is no, you know, the gas is, is, is not a bridge, you know, um, to, to anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of fossil fuels, but then that's not just an idea. That's like a that's going to translate into activism. It's actually part of the part of the strategy, and but it's a financial question. Um, you know, if I, I do a lot of work with large corporates, and and they're very, they're acutely aware of the pressure that these campaigns put on them financially, right? That they do slow things down, that approvals get more difficult, and so on. So. You know, solar is is solar sort of an easy ride through that process. It means that for an investor, that there is lower risks, there's lower complications, there's general government and community support. You know, for most renewables and certainly on the solar side of it, and that that's an important question in that in that space. So I think, but I think gas is a big issue, obviously, but I think it also it it has negative sides in terms of uh, slowing down investment in clean in true clean tech. But it has a very big upside of, of destroying the coal industry, and mm -hmm. and that's you know, thermal coal industry is now on the run, and there's a range. You know, everyone claims credit for that. You know, campaigners claim credit for it. The gas industry claims credit for it. You know, what well, doesn't really matter policy, but I don't really care who gets credit for it. Right. The point is that you know Goldman Sachs, for example, had a report out this this week, uh, talking about the fact that the window for new investments in thermal coal was now closing. Right, because even without strong action on climate change, or even without carbon pricing, just the future risk of action on carbon pricing, the future risk of it, you know, made the advantage of coal over alternative fuel sources really marginal. Right, so what it wasn't actually the fact that it was, you know, that that, that, that the there is going to be policy at a certain date. It was just the assumption that one day there will be, and that these are long-term investments, and therefore you'd be a mug. If you're investing in coal, not to take it, not to take account of that, and that's really very, very powerful because it means that all the the, um, the, the the if you can't put new investment into a space, right, then there's a whole bunch of market flow on from that in terms of exposure um, of those companies to increased risk. It means that 
only the lowest cost assets um, in terms of sources of coal can be used. It means that the, the export market, that the US companies are relying on to make up for the collapsing demand in the US is no longer going to be there. You know, Goldman Sachs is forecasting a, a very significant drop to virtually zero in terms of growth of coal imports into China. You know, some really? people are forecasting, yeah, some people are forecasting a, which, which is not very uh, widely supported, but some people are saying coal, China could be a coal exporter. Um, they're moving so strongly against coal consumption. So, now, yeah, these things are unpredictable and, and who knows who's yeah. right. But the point is, they're very big big shifts in the market and they're very significant shifts. And if you if you see the collapse of the coal industry globally as, as a place where it has no future, it's effectively a rogue industry in decline, the psychology of that in terms yeah. of future carbon risk is just enormous. And I think that the movement hasn't yet caught up to how significant that is. Um, and it's sort of focusing on, on old ideas about coal demand in China and India and so on. I'm not saying coal is not a dead, but, but the idea of coal having a boom time ahead, massive new mines opening up in Australia and elsewhere, I think is just completely a fantasy. And I think it's, it's not going to happen. And I think that banks and investors won't be backing it. And therefore those, those new mines won't go ahead. And that is going to be symbolically a very powerful influence in terms of market perception about carbon risk and climate change. And again, it's going to, Put this psychology of inevitability into the into the argument. And so the Goldman piece, I mean, it's an interesting. The Goldman piece, you're saying it, but their argument is not that it's a bad investment from the standpoint of just you know cost compared to alternatives. It actually has to do with the risks associated with with public will and you know yeah. in opposite, right? Yeah, and the threat. Yeah, they're saying it's a combination of things, but they're saying obviously gas is one of the influences. Um, yeah. But the assumption of increase, oh, sorry, existing tightening of environmental regulations in general, the risk of increasing carbon regulation in China and India and the US, um, and and that 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 risk of that regu that new action um, can be priced in as a risk. And once you price that risk in, the cost benefit of coal right, right. becomes really marginal. And that the cost of bringing on new mines is actually not 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 supported by their forecast around pricing. Right. It's really interesting because there's an interesting you know if that if, if that's all correct that there's an interesting interplay there between the movement of people who are demanding action on climate policy and and industry. And in this case, you know, it sounds like. That industry is actually moving ahead of policy, but they're doing it in anticipation of policy. And in some ways, they're creating the space for policy to actually happen. So policymakers will actually follow the space that's being created by industry, but they're creating that space in anticipation. Just yeah, that's no, a very and a, 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 important to see that as a system. That yeah. you know, it's not one leads the other one. It's they, they they kind of lead each other in this sort of cycle of I will if you will and so on and so on and so on. Move forward. Which gets to I think. Um, back to the really the important role of the community, people who are advocating, you know, the activist community, people who are demanding action on climate. So, because you could look at that and you could say efforts of, you know, carbon tracker, and, and you were explaining to me earlier that a, a little bit of the carbon tracker work actually goes back, you know, a couple of decades to work that was done at Greenpeace, and maybe others have done this, and the time wasn't perhaps right. But now the arguments to say that you know, to investors, to the financial community, saying that these are bad bets for, for your investments because they could be stranded assets, is actually making a difference. And the work of, you know, Bill, you know, another post federal fellow, Bill McKibben, and 350, and all the others who are, you know, calling for divestment and really, really pushing hard, you know, both in terms of calls for divestment, but actually action, where people are taking, you know, are doing civil disobedience actions, you know, that, that is actually having an impact. And therefore, our own mentality, our own psychology about whether or not, you know, we're winning or we can win, win is really important. And so that, that seems a lot about what you were emphasizing in your piece. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. And also, I'm curious to know what kind of reaction you got when you, when you said victory in hand, you know. What kind of reaction do you get from within the community? Yeah, it's a really, um, the, the, there's an incredible resistance to the idea of success in the movement, funnily enough. Like, the, there's a, come back to your last point first, it, it, there is, you know, people want to, of course people want to succeed, 
Uh, there is this sort of, uh, there's a psychology of, of um, not psychology of failure, but psychology of victimhood, if you like, in, in the sort of climate movement where, where the, the enemy is so powerful and we are so weak um, that, that, you know, it, it, and, and I understand where it comes from. It comes from many movements that you need to kind of, you know, get ready for battle kind of thing. And so you have to paint the battle as enormous to give yourself strength. And so that's understandable, uh, and you know where it comes from, but it's also self-defeating once you get to a certain point. And my argument is that we've got to that point where the psychology is actually very important to behave as though, you know, we are going to make sure this now wins, that this issue is going to drive forward, because that actually drives practical outcomes in the market. Right? There's a practical outcome of that is that if investors feel as though there's just going to be increasing pressure from activism on policymakers, so there's going to be increasing policy being made because of the success of the alternative technologies makes it possible to make stronger policy, and there's going to be increasing uh, inter international interconnectedness. You know, rem remembering that the reason we've had a solar boom, you know, can be traced back to feed-in tariffs in Germany, driving mass production in in China, which then drove mass installations in Australia and the US which then drove the price down again in China, right? So, you know, there was no policy in the US that drove that. Primarily, it was policy in Germany that drove it. Um, now, the German solar industry suffered in that process because they were high-cost manufacturers, right? But, that, that, but again, that complicated system played out in a way which meant that there is um, momentum in the marketplace generally you know, for solar. Now, you know, I don't want to overstate that because, as I say, the amount of solar in the world is still relatively small compared to the amount of, of coal and oil being burned. You can see how that change starts to occur, and the psychology again of the movement in that process is actually is actually very very important. Right. Yeah. It's um. And I'd be curious to know, you know, in your conversations with industry, if you've actually practiced that psychology, if you've gone into those conversations with folks, and basically, you know, had the attitude that you know, I mean, especially when talking about the fossil fuel industry, that your business model is 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 doomed. You know, what kind of what kind of reaction do you get from folks? Do you have a sense of how people in the coal industry or you know oil and gas are sure. feeling? Yeah, no, I do. You know, I do have those conversations a lot. Um, both in my work here at Cambridge, um, but also just in direct relationships with those other companies. And it, it, it's it's very interesting how just the last few years it's shifted quite profoundly, um, and there was almost no resistance to the idea just for the timing, right? So so there's no one saying we're not going to do this. There's no one saying coal has a long-term future. There's no one saying fossil fuels will last, will, will, will be used forever. Uh, the dispute is really about when that's going to hit. And that's why the the timing of, of, of policy, the timing of market responses is so important. Because you know, markets are basically lemmings. You know, the, the, the markets move when markets move. And everyone thinks they're going to predict the right time and, and go first. The reality is they're all going to go together. And so the the, the reaction in, inside you know corporate boardrooms now is very much of yes, coal you know thermal coal in particular has a, has a really bad future. Um, the question is is that a this year, next year, five year, ten year, fifteen, twenty year argument? You know, and that's when the, that's when the sort of analysis comes. Now. You know, that analysis, of course, is, is, is heavily influenced by what they want to be the case. And that's why it's important to remember that in these great economic transformations that we've seen in many industries, most incumbents fail. Right? You, you don't get a lot of incumbents in industries that are able to transform. Most of them you know, go broke, are bankrupt, or are swallowed up into other firms for you know, smaller asset valuations or whatever. So you just don't get that level of... of Transformation happening inside most companies, and and most companies know that. Yeah. Right. So it always surprises me that someone who argues what I argue gets access to these people. You know, yeah. because I'm, I'm making it a very bad story for them, and I, and I don't change the message for anybody. It's the same message. Um, but of course, what's going on is they recognise the risk to themselves of missing. You know, their you know their their Kodak moment, if you like. You know, when when you see something coming so clearly, we can't respond in time. And it's a strategy question for companies. Yeah, let's remember, you know, Kodak, for example, goes goes bankrupt, but Fuji didn't. 
now same you know both film companies both facing the same dilemmas and same pressures different business strategies right so it's not inevitable that old companies will fail in this space but it's, it's the tendency of old companies to fail yeah. and therefore the conversation really you know, increasingly now is one of okay we better be very careful now but we don't miss miss the miss the, you know, the transformation and of course it's very different if you're peabody coal and you just do coal right or if you're a diversified resource company or if you're an oil gas and whatever company uh, yeah. so that that structure of your business makes a very big difference to how how you react yeah yeah i think yeah, it's interesting and you're right those those different sectors are different you have different situations it does seem to me that um like when you look at a lot of the, the oil majors they're they're doubling down you know, mm. maybe Probably because what they're dealing with with liquid fuels is a slightly different different situation, you know, than looking at at a resource just for electricity production. But you know, you it seems to me that they're they're spending. I mean, you know, capex now six hundred fifty billion dollars are spending a lot of money to try to build up their reserves of these these hydro power plants, and and I think you know, on the one hand, you could argue to them that and say that you guys are making a bad, you know, you're making bad long-term decision in terms of your investments, mm. and you're locking yourself into some way. On the other hand, I imagine that they have they, they have shareholder pressure. Yeah. You know, for them, mm. the valuations are based in part on their on their reserve numbers, and they need to show that they're you know, they're they're good at doing this certain kind of thing for them to shift you know their direction completely. Especially when I would think it would be a matter of Investing in something that doesn't have quite the immediate return on that, so mm. that, that that's a tough prospect. I mean, that's where the market I think comes into play as well, where it might make it difficult for them to actually significantly adjust because the expectations of shareholders is that they do better job what they're doing now, and, and given these these returns, nobody's going to bet on them to be able to switch gears. It's a really it's a very dynamic. Process that one though. That, that there's a bit in the Economist this week talking about the you know medium term decline of the of the global oil majors mm -hmm. I mean, on the grounds of you know the in, in, in the some analysis and the Economist supports that analysis says that oil demand won't be going up any anywhere like um, people are forecasting and therefore given that the oil majors internationally tend to have the dirtiest most expensive, most difficult sources of reserves that they're bringing on now, um, that they, they depend upon a very high price of oil. And, and it's a very interesting counter argument to, to lots of the other stuff around the because but what the economists are saying is that demand you know, will be constrained a lot more than people think by energy efficiency, electric cars, and, and preferences of people for less cars and so on. Um, and that the, um, the big cheap reserves have been, you know, basically owned by national oil companies, uh, and therefore the, the international super majors are, are actually in trouble as a result of that long term. And their argument is that that's currently being showed in the markets lack like of interest in investing in them, so they're not they're not quite as they were. Now you know, that's that's definitely beyond my capacity to understand what what which is right in that very different and very varied analysis about their prospects, but. The point is that there is a really significant uncertainty for investors in the future of this industry. And that's not just about coal. There is the stuff that Coach Carlin has been talking about, which is Heimberg has been writing about in terms of gas. Is it overhyped? There's question marks about long-term oil demand. There's potentially very significant um, price reductions in solar and wind, which will then drive electric cars to be a more viable option. Now, there's complications of all these things actually happening at scale. But the point is it's a very dynamic and uncertain market. And in that context, money tends to go to the lower risk choices. So those things tend to drive money away from high risk uncertainty like new coal, you know, gas and oil, and towards things which clearly have a good future and a more secure future. And you know, solar and, and other renewables in that area are actually very exciting places for, for money to go right now, and that becomes so fulfilling. Do you feel that you know, the, the combination of sort of the movement of people that are demanding you know, significant action coupled with investor concern, you know, and um, and is, is growth, it's still, you know, like as you said, a small percentage of total production, but there's rapid growth, you know, in 
solar and when that um, that will actually create, create the space for meaningful policy to happen. Uh, yeah, and I think it's really it, it's really important to remember how much policy doesn't come until it's almost not needed. Yeah, I mean, it's still needed in this space, but the point is that the fact that solar is now so exciting as an industry and can grow and can actually take up the demand um, for new power generation means that governments will be more confident about putting in place policy. And we've seen that in China in particular, whereas Chinese policy has just ramped up and up and up in terms of targets around renewables. And that, that is a very significant indicator that of, of, of their confidence in, in what that industry can deliver. And it's, it's you know, policy leads and best and the best lead policy. And so I think there is a, a, a powerful argument, you know, not, not there yet, but there's a powerful argument that says that we're going to see a big upswing in policy action in this area. Not globally, in an integrated way, but in a state, country by country basis. Um, and the driver will be as much economic as, as environmental. So they're going to see that there is a boom happening in this space and they're in danger of being left behind in that process. And you know, there's a whole the range of things around renewables which haven't even been priced into the market at all yet. And the most obvious one is zero fuel cost. Now, it's just a completely different business idea that you invest in the capital up front Right, and then have no running costs. That just completely changes the dynamics of the marketplace. So the idea of buying, you know, buying your own solar panels, buying a share of your power station, right, and then you getting free power from that thereafter. Right, it's a very different kind of it opens up all sorts of different business ideas and different structures and community co-ops and ownership structures and so on. And that, that that's all we get to play for. And technology Digital technology, control technology, you know, energy efficiency technology, this is all part of one kind of emerging ecosystem of business, which I think is going to drive a lot of change. And that, that will then in turn put new demands on policy. That our policy is, is, is designed for big centralised grids. Right? And we have to think about that differently. And that, and that I think the policy people are going to have to catch up in that sense with what the technology is offering. Yeah, I think that... Um, and this isn't overly simplistic uh, way of looking at it, but you know, when it comes to policy, I mean, let's say renewable solar in particular has benefited from there being some um, some incentives that are created, you know, in terms of tax credits and places or other other ways of incentivizing, which is a policy approach, right? I think for sure. Um, and maybe that has been. You know, that has been uh, sort of gone under the radar in terms of being, you know, directly attacked by kind of the incumbency, right? It, one thing I wonder about is at what point will they really feel threatened enough, you know, to, to try to attack those things? And, and the other is, will, will large corporations, I mean, you're talking about just distributed energy, right? And in some ways, citizen, citizen controlled, you know, energy. Which obviously we are hugely in favor of, you know. But at some point, that threat is going to become real enough that, and you talk about utilities scrambling to try to figure out what to do. We have very small examples of them being threatened, like here where I happen to live in Sonoma County, Northern California. You know, we just had um, a uh, community choice aggregation thing go through, basically, which allows the you know the county coming. Uh, Deciding that they're going to purchase their own power through their own you know, power purchasing agreements, and then they brought in the cities. There's actually a campaign right now to get all the cities on board, you know, and basically it's to provide you know utility um, end users with choice. Do they want their energy to come from a utility company that services us, or do we want to be able to purchase credits for renewables? Um, the long-term goal of being able to actually develop and generate our own renewable energy here in the county. Um, and, you know, the utility company, you know, obviously has seen that as a threat, you know, and in this case they acted differently than they had when, when the county that was south of us were the first one in the state actually went through with this. And they were attacked heavily, you know. Um, and so that's the utility seeing a threat, recognizing a threat, and deciding to go after it. And I do kind of wonder how industry, you know, who's interested, not so much in doing business in a very specific way, but in making a profit. So if they can't provide electricity the way that they provide it with renewable power, 
they find, find another way to control power. Centralized possible. So, so I think even while we're having, you could say we're having the signs of this going in the right direction, there are still battles to come. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. And, and, and they're, they're, not, that, they're not to come in some places, like in Australia. <laughs> the utilities that were previously very strongly in favour of renewable energy and acts on climate change, um, several of them have reversed their positions dramatically and are now campaigning against the renewable energy targets. Um, on the ground, you know, they, they use different arguments. It's because they're losing market share, and it threatens the the survival of the, of the utility business model. So that's a, that's a live debate now in Australia and elsewhere, um, whereby they are now counterattacking very strongly. But it's interesting because this you know, there's a, a case in the US where the Tea Party came out in support of renewables on the ground that it was in in, in, a, in a, I forget where it was in some area in the US because of the independence and, you know, not wanting to give power up to the corporate sector in, in terms of their control of energy supply. So there's a whole bunch of interesting ideological twists on this issue. Um, so just because people are going to fight, doesn't mean, fight resist, it doesn't mean they're going to win. And again, it's just the fact that the psychology of the whole movement is that if you think of the enemy of climate change action as being a unified, you know, corporate, you know, sector, it, it's, it's a profoundly incorrect analysis of what's going on. Um, the, the business community does not act in a unified way. Um, the, they are, there are many fossil fuel companies um, that are full of people who are deeply concerned about climate change um, and, of course, don't want to see action on it too fast. They lose their business, but they understand it very well. And they're not naive or, or, or skeptics about it at all. And then there are you know, genuinely... You know, I would argue approaching evil people in that sector, you know, uh, who are deliberately and consciously undermining and financing campaigns to undermine the science and so on. So, but don't see it as a single unified idea because that will actually make the movement actually weaker. Right? You've got to recognise that 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 markets fight to defend themselves. It's perfectly reasonable to do so. That there's nothing wrong with a company arguing to defend its self interest, and they have to be beaten. Uh, yeah. and, and they can be beaten in a range of ways and, and it's, not a, it's not an anti-market or anti-corporate thing. It is a anti that particular behaviour kind of idea. And, and companies do change, companies are destroyed, markets do change. And you have to believe in that if you want to have a chance of success. So do you think in, 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 there's not one single approach, obviously, to this? In, in fact, you know, we're talking about here incredibly complex systems, you know, when there are all these feedback loops between happening in the business sector and policymakers and the public. Um, but in terms of successes, you could say for the movement, probably. And if you would argue that the, the nervousness that we're seeing within the investment community is a result, a direct result of the agitation that's happening you know, from the, from the climate movement. You know, is, is continued success, one, I, I would say, and tell me if I'm wrong, but you would argue that we have to believe that we can and that we, that we actually see signs. It's not completely delusional. And but is it is it best to continue to to sort of approach the fossil fuel industry? I know that they're not you know one you know, homogeneous body in the sense that they speak with one voice. But is it better to attack them, vilify them, you know, approach them, and when, when speaking of them as as a dinosaur industry that is not going to be part of the you know, the second half of the 21st century? Or is it better to approach them and, and go to them almost like a counselor and say, look, I've got some bad news for you. You know, mm -hmm. you're going in the wrong direction. You need to sh you know, shift gears and act more in a sort of a friendly way. Or is it, you know, there are people who actually get in to have meetings, like like you and others that you might know, into boardrooms. That's your role to do that. And in the meantime, people on the street need to be chaining themselves like bulldozers in the, in the pipeline camp. Look, I, I think it is a combination, but I, I do think I'd have a kind of, you know, if I was trying to bring it together, I would say that that understand that this this is all about changing the market, and the market is a system. So you, you shouldn't expect a fossil fuel company to agree to its own device. Right? It's just not going to. Um, and it would be insane for it to do so. Now, that doesn't mean they're evil. That just means that their industry has to go. Uh, so I, I talk about this in terms of we have to remove the fossil fuel industry from the economy with love and compassion. Uh, and I'm sort of being a little bit flippant 
in saying that because, because it's you know like we it, it's but it should be done with integrity. So I don't I don't buy the demonising argument generally against an industry if it implies that those people are somehow less of being or you know inherently evil or bad people that should be shamed into into behaviour change and so on. That doesn't mean we should always be nice to the industry, right? Because the industry is doing stuff that is destroying the, the planet and potentially destroying, you know, our economy and civilization and our future. So they have to be stopped. But it doesn't mean that they should be stopped by saying you're bad, you're evil, you know, everything about you is wrong. It's just, you know, it is the council of conversation saying, oh, they've got bad news for you. You know, you're finished. And, and you have to get out of the economy now. And it's, it's not impersonal. Personal. Um, it's, it's just the industry has to now be removed from the economy because otherwise our economy and our society is going to suffer. Now, that will happen in a variety of ways. We don't expect you to sort of voluntarily, you know, disappear. But you should be aware that we're coming after you, you know, as a society. And, you know, in the same way we came after cigarettes. You know, it's not, it's, it's not demonising in the sense of individuals, but it is actually demonising in terms of we're going to make it more expensive. We're going to put policy in place to make it more difficult, right? We're going to make it difficult for you to recruit good talent, right? Because people aren't going to want to work for companies that have been declined, right? So these things are all part of that systemic process. And so I think the, the kind of, yes, there is, a, there is a role for people, you know, attacking the Koch brothers, for example, as an example of companies that are misusing their power, abusing their power in very bad ways and should be held to account for it. Uh, there are examples of fossil fuel companies that, that need to diversify and can diversify into a new approach. There are examples of companies that will just cease to exist, you know, because they're pure coal plays, for example, and it's too late for them to change. And so that, that combination, I think, is, is important to understand how that system works. And it also helps to understand strategy and how to approach them in appropriately differentiated ways as well. Yeah, I think one of the challenges is that we, we have, have to have multi you know, we have to have two or three or four minds uh, in the yeah. sense that recognizing stepping back and recognizing that in, in a different situation these different tactics you know, are, are most appropriate being able to sort of step back and say this is what the situation provides you know um and then the other and this gets back to sort of the psychology thing i think that what you're arguing i think is really important it's part of why i want to have a conversation with you is because i think that for those of us who look at the science, right, there's not a lot to feel optimistic about. It's, and, um, and then when you look at the forces that we're up against, you know, sort of the inertia and the, the resources and all, you know, all that that we're up against, it's easy to feel like this is not something that we can win. But I agree with you that it's very important that we have that we actually believe that, why are we here? And I think the truth is that most of us don't really believe that. But somehow, um, it's what we know, is to sort of feel like, we can't win this thing, but we're going to go down fighting or something. Yeah. Um, I think that you're, you're pointing to evidence of, that it might not be quite that bad. And at the same time, we have to recognize the, the evidence that with every passing day, the climate story is, is Worsen, in a sense. You know, and I think that the way we look at it here at Post Carbon Institute is not just the climate story, there are all these other indicators, as you know, you, you talked about before, of us hitting limits, you know, to, to kind of the way that we've lived for the last couple of years. And that's distressing. So somehow we have to be of two minds, in a sense, to recognize the severity of the situation that we're in, and that we are past the mitigation phase, in a sense, you know. But that we can't just go, we, you know, there's a danger to also going into this space, not just of the feeling that we've lost, but of solely focusing, if you want to call it adaptation, basically saying we can't win this fight. So what we have to do is figure out the best ways to make sure that people don't suffer. I think on some level we have to do that. There's some portion of our energies that have to go to that because there's so much already baked in. Um, but at the, at the same, same time, time, we have to also believe that we must mitigate and we can actually win on that front. So, and I think that that's what's challenging for people psychologically, is to kind of hold those two truths together in their minds.
And, and maybe, 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 maybe not everyone can do that. Maybe, you know, people, people focus on one or the other. Right? Uh, I think that last point is really important. That not everyone has to think about the whole thing all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My particular focus and my kind of job, if you like, in, in society is to do that. Um, and so I think about the whole system as, as a kind of as my contribution, if you like, to the to the movement. Um, but the the but it is it's absolutely right. It, 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 it's full of paradox. Um, and I think the thing that I hold on to, and that I talk people a lot about this issue of despair, and, and, and I write about this a lot in my book, The Great Disruption, is that you have to recognise that, that you know, this is not a binary question. We, we don't all succeed, climate change isn't a problem, or you know, we're all dead, right? There is actually a lot of places in between right, where we can go to. So it's not just a question of, you know, um, uh, can we save ourselves, can we stop climate change? It's a question of the, the more we stop it, the more we slow it down, right, the, the more we mitigate, the less suffering there will be. These are really practical issues for the future. And, and whether we're moving into a, you know, civilization collapse or whether we're moving into a civilization going through a very difficult period, right, these are very different outcomes. And so the action we take today you know, one can argue we've lost already in the sense that the climate is changing and it's going to accelerate and get worse before we can possibly bring under control. Um, that doesn't mean that the battle is actually over completely. What it means is that we didn't prevent it from becoming a problem. Okay, so now we're here. Now we can just walk away from that and say, okay, well, it's all over, which is sort of jettisoning future generations and saying, bad luck, guys, you're on your own, which is an appallingly, you know, immoral kind of position to take. Um, but it's, it's, it's like, like it's, 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 not not a, it's not a digital question, question. it's an analogue question. question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore, therefore everything we do counts a lot. And that's one of the things that keeps me going in terms of optimism, is that, that you have to recognise that the more we do, every little bit we do, makes the future more livable and more manageable for those people coming after us. No, no, no I think you're right. I think we, um, I don't know if you've read John Michael's work at all. There's a great essay I can send it to you about these two dominant stories we have, you know, it's just in our culture, you know, one is the story of the Ethiopian culture system. And stories are very powerful for us, right? And, and I think it's easy for us to fall into these camps where we think that the future is going to be one thing or the other. And the truth of the matter is that it's going to be a combination of the both and lots of things that we can't even anticipate yet, you know. And uh, so somehow holding those multiple truths I think it's a real challenge for people, yeah. and, and, and I can un understand, you know, you and I were fortunate to be engaged in this work, you know, as, as part of our life's call. A lot of people out there just don't know how to do that, and so it's, it's understandable why it's just too hard. It's just simply too hard to think about it and to maintain that. And, they, and so finding ways for people to, 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 you know, to be part of this, this ongoing dialogue, this ongoing transformation that's happening is important. Um, and at the same time, I think for those of us, you know, I, I put a lot of expectation on those of us who are actually lucky enough. I think of it that way, that we are lucky enough to be engaged in these, these contractible problems, you know? And, and one of those things is to always keep in mind that as we're fighting, you know, that we, we always keep in mind a future that we want to have and recognizing that it's not, not even as simple as, as you know, know, unplugging a coal plant and plugging in you know, large-scale concentrated solar and saying problem solved. solved. How are difficult that is? You know? we, have we have to look even more, more systemically and realize that much of the way that we live is simply unsustainable. And, and it might not be a simple matter of saying that we'll find a way to have electric vehicles versus you know, uh, you know, internal combustion engine power. You might need to think really fundamentally differently about it. We live in our works and, and, and so, so while we're fighting this stuff, stuff let's let's uh let's keep fighting for those victories but recognize that you know that we might accept some short term things like you know, large scale development and uh you know um the bringing on of large scale solar and wind projects but that may not be the future okay uh, and, and in the Great Disruption, I talk about there being ultimately two phases of this, this sort of transition. The first is, you know, fixing climate change, 
right? Which right. obviously, as you say, is not as simple as it sounds. Um, but then the second phase really is saying, okay, well, then and that well, the first phase of addressing climate change, hopefully, if successful, will keep us stable as a civilization to then actually face up to the reality of the insanity of infinite growth, that there is no model, that you can have a 100% renewable powered zero CO2 economy, you can't keep on growing. You know, and, and so that, that and we're going to have to face that. But I think there is a the phased approach to that. And so I think we're right to keep it in the back of our minds um, and, and, and think about resilience and think about you know, distributed power being inherently a better idea. So these are all part of getting us ready for that second phase of, of, of the transition, if you like, towards a genuine sustainable society. I mean, I, mean, I do. It's, it's an interesting question if those could be phased or not. You know, um, part of me thinks that the common movement will eventually have to become a new common movement in the sense that um, we, we, you know, we fundamentally need to shift the economic system that we're in. As you said, it's predicated on growth. And, and it's hard for me to imagine that we'll be able to grow, you know, solely on our solar budget, so to speak. And, and I also think that there are many more people that are concerned about issues of equity and the fact that the economies are working for them. And there are actually people who are actively engaged in that issue. If we bring those things together, and it would be very difficult, and I'm not saying that when you go into a world of separation, you should be talking about the end of growth and the end of you know, That might be stretching it too far. But at some point, these things are going to come together, and I think that you need to recognize that there's actually a strength. I mean, all, you talk about solar co-ops and those kinds of things. There, there is a huge movement afoot. It's still small, but it's growing of people that are trying to build a new economy. And a lot of those people are in the same camps. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not something like we, we do climate change and then we do a new economy. You know, my argument all the way through in my work has been that we're actually doing both now. We just should be realistic that, that um, climate change is no longer a 20 or 30 year issue. It's a you know, zero to five year issue. Um, and we're going to face a very difficult period very quickly. Um, and therefore, we're going to have to kind of stabilise things enough to have an economy, to have a, to have a society that can then move on to that next phase. But the actions we take now should be taken in the light, as you say, of where, where we're going to end up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think and that's where you're, I mean, if it is a zero to five or ten year window, where I get really concerned is that right now we're being told that we've got this great abundance of, here in the United States, we've got this great abundance of gas and oil. You know, we have a whole other story that's happening in terms of energy right now. And the investments we make just in the next five or ten years are going to be really important. And that's part of why we are pushing so hard to try to communicate that this is a bubble. You know, this the shale revolution is actually a bubble. And that what's so dangerous about it is that Right, right when this is happening, this bubble is happening, is the time where we need to be taking everything, everything we're investing in that, we're investing, investing in renewables. Okay. And it's it's a big concern, and that's where I think you're right that we need to be we need to be arguing some of this stuff just on economic terms. And terms. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, I really appreciate this conversation. I think um, you know, uh, I read that piece with a lot of interest, and, and it seems like a lot of other people did, and. And you, and you probably got a lot of pushback from people, people you know, know that you were being Pollyannish or something, I don't know. But, um, but I appreciate you pushing on that front. And I do think that recognizing the, the psychology, our own psychology, is very important in terms of like effectiveness. And I, I really appreciate you challenging folks who are concerned about these issues and thinking about that. Yeah, and pointing to actually real things to look at as markers for success. But I appreciate it. And, and uh, keep it up. Good. 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 Good